Hi, Jenna. Hi, Frank. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. And, and thanks for taking the time to, to talk to me today. Um, um, I really wanted to speak to you, uh, obviously, about what's been happening in the last, uh, I've lost track now, is it six weeks or seven weeks, I guess? Um, it does feel long, I've got to say. Um, you know, the what we've been used to for guys that, you know, I remember Operation Cast Lead um, was uh, about four weeks, I think. And uh, so seven weeks already feels like a, a very long time. But I want you to talk to you about many things, including um, kind of what we hear in the news, um, some of the, I guess, fake news we hear, um, you know, that are part of the propaganda uh, of the Israeli government and army. Um, we we both know that to conduct a, a massacre, a genocide, you have to dehumanize people so much before that propaganda is needed. Um, but I want you to start because it's sort of news, even if it's not. Joe Biden um, repeated again, I think it was yesterday, that he's not going to call for a ceasefire. Uh, you know, the war is going to continue until Hamas is 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 defeated. So I want you to ask you how much of a US war this is as much of a, an Israeli war. This is entirely a US and Israel war. This isn't just Israel that is attacking Gaza and carrying out genocide, massacres, ethnic cleansing of of the Gaza Strip, but this is entirely backed by and financed by the United States government. So, Frank, we've seen that that the United States has not only given diplomatic support to Israel, but they've also bullied other countries around the world into supporting this massacre, supporting this genocide. They've not only stopped there, but they've financed it. And we see even more money that is now earmarked to Israel coming through the United States Congress and, uh, and elsewhere. Plus, we've also seen that the United States has sent aircraft carrier ships as well as troops. So once again, this isn't just Israel attacking the Gaza Strip. It's Israel and the U.S. combined that are attacking what is effectively a large refugee camp, perhaps the largest refugee camp in the world, where 80% of Gaza's residents are people who are refugees originally, and 50% of them are children. This is, they're stateless, now homeless, no army, defenseless, and Biden keeps persisting because he has attached himself to the sinking ship that's called Netanyahu. And that sinking ship called Netanyahu is a person who's going to continue to carry out massacres and genocide so that he can continue to remain in office. As long as he is carrying out these massacres, this ethnic cleansing, this genocide, Nobody within the Israeli government is going to topple him. But as soon as he stops, they will, because uh, the Israeli public was so fed up with, it, with Netanyahu on the eve of all of this, and they actually blame Netanyahu for all of this. So it's just a question of time. And so this is why he wants to prolong it as much as possible. What about, I mean, talking about Netanyahu and I guess the Israeli government, what about the question, because it's um, it's in everyone's sort of mouth, of the Israeli hostages? We've we've heard there were leaks that about four days into the, let's call it the war, Hamas offered uh, a four days ceasefire in exchange of many, I don't know how many, but many hostages, and that Netanyahu refused. Um, what, how did how did the, I mean, because you you live in Haifa, how did sort of the Israeli public react to this or the families of the, of the, you know, the hostages? It wasn't even so much of a leak. It was very open. It was, it was stated very openly. And look, it's become very clear that, that Israel doesn't care for, for those Israelis who are in Gaza. They, they really don't. Um, what Netanyahu wants is 
is he just wants to carry out as much of, attack, of an attack on the Gaza Strip. He wants to flatten it. Those are those are some of the words that members in his cabinet have used. He wants to make it smaller. Again, members of his cabinet have have used this. Um, he he doesn't care about the Israelis that are in Gaza. In fact, what's interesting, Frank, is that at one point in time, a few days into Israel's attack on the Gaza Strip, we saw a rally by the families who came forward and said, we don't care at what price Israel has to pay, including releasing all of the political prisoners. Release all of them. We just want our families back. This is coming from the mouths of the family members of those Israelis who are in Gaza. And yet again, uh, Netanyahu ignored this because fundamentally he does not believe in in doing anything to bring them back he will he's completely intent on flattening gaza because as i said this is where he continues to hold on to power nobody's going to want to remove the general in the middle of a war he knows that and this is why he's prolonging it and this is why by the way he's also pushing for biden to continue to support the attack on gaza even though it's become apparent now that what, who, they're killing kids, they're killing the elderly, they're attacking hospitals. This is a war on, on hospitals. They've uh, hit schools, they've hit churches, they've hit mosques, they've flattened universities. This is all about them, Israel, destroying Palestinian infrastructure and life to make the Gaza Strip completely unlivable. But how, how far can, can, let's say, Netanyahu go? I mean, how far can he go? There's a point where he's, he's going to have to stop. Because, I mean, we were talking with friends and stuff. Some of them, you know, are thinking that it's going to be more like 82 Beirut. He really wants to drive Hamas, whatever it means, out of Gaza. So this could last for... But at one point, I mean, the, the, the numbers are so horrific. It's like, you know... 11,000 at least now, including, as you said, at least 4,000 children. What's the end game? When is, you know, when is he's going to have to stop at one point? But does he? This is the part um, that is terrifying for Palestinians. So far, we've seen that Israel's killed 11,500 Palestinians that we know of. There are more than 2,000 who remain trapped under rubble. Half of them are kids, by the way. But I fully expect that we're going to start seeing deaths from other um, things as well, from disease, from um, lack of hygiene because there's no water, from people getting infected, um, from starvation. Doctors are already reporting that they're beginning to see people come in with maggots coming out of their limbs and out of their wounds. People, doctors are already reporting that starvation has kicked in. And starvation usually hits the weakest elements of society first and then goes on and on and on. And I fully expect that we're gonna see all of these sorts of, of killings and deaths in the coming days and weeks. If the fact that they can bomb hospitals has not shaken the world into telling Israel to stop, then I don't think that there is any end for, for Netanyahu. But, but more importantly, Frank, is that he's made it clear what he wants to do and his cabinet has made it clear. We have an Israeli president who said there are no innocents in Gaza. That's so dehumanizing. That just paves the way for genocide. And that's what they've done. We've heard Israeli cabinet ministers um, say that this should be Nakba 2.0. We've heard the Israeli foreign minister come out and say that Gaza is going to be smaller in size. We've seen proposals where they're calling for, these are, proposals from the government. 
where they're calling for the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians into the Sinai Peninsula. We've seen op-eds be written by members of Knesset, some of them in the so-called centrist camp, you know, centrist camp, and some right wing, where they try to portray the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in a humanitarian way, calling upon nations around the world to take in Gazans um, because they want to get rid of Palestinians. We know what Netanyahu's end goal is, which is the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. We know that that's what he wants to do. And what's so shocking in all of this is that these politicians see the same images that you and I see. They see the images of a little girl writhing in pain because she's lost both of her limbs and there is no medicine to, no painkillers, no anesthesia. Um, we've seen that. They've seen that. And the fact that they're not willing to demand that Israel stop, even as it continues to bomb hospitals, schools, mosques, churches, it shows to me that there are no limits. There are no limits any longer. And the world has given Israel the greenest of green lights. And Netanyahu is going through it. So it's it, this isn't just 1982 of driving out the PLO. This is 1948 and the continuation of 1948. It, it's very hard to... Um... It's very hard to actually, um, you know, listening to you, and because um, we we are experiencing. I mean, I'm not. We are experiencing uh, pretty much a genocide live on TV. We've experienced. I remember uh, when the Iraq invasion started in 2003. You know, watching the sort of first images of like that's it. The US has started, and you could see like it was during the night sort of the missiles and stuff going in. So it was like, you know, a war live on TV. But I feel like this is even worse because we, it, you know, we, we're saying, yeah. Watching genocide. We're watching genocide live. And, and th this can only happen because Palestinians and actually Muslims, I know not all Palestinians are Muslims, but that's the way they are seen abroad, have been so dehumanized um, and the propaganda of, of the Israeli government, which is, by the way, which I find, by the way, so bad. So, you know, you know what, like, sort of drives me crazy is that some of the stuff we see, like we found, um, we found like guns in the hospital and they show you this picture, like very close up, you, you don't know where it is. It's like as if, you know, I could have put like guns in my whatever bedroom and took a picture. They, And no one, I mean, at least in the mainstream media, challenges that. And the evidence they show is so, so it's like, it's so amateur, but they don't really give a damn anymore. They, they can say anything, the, the weirdest claims. And uh, there was something about Mein Kampf as well. They found a copy of Mein Kampf in like a kid's bed. The craziest fucking thing and people at least i mean the mainstream media and stuff we, we you know they are party guilty as well keep repeating it uh, for example but i want to ask you as well actually because you're a lawyer even if hamas's headquarters were under al-shifa hospital can you as a, an army you know is it a reason to bomb the hospital can you, are you allowed to bomb the hospital under international humanitarian law? So this is the part that people don't seem to get. And you don't need to be a lawyer for this, Frank. This is, it's just common sense. The, the sick and the wounded need treatment. Where do they get treatment? In a hospital. It is not legal for Israel to bomb hospitals. They can try to twist and turn international legal principles Etc. But nothing about it is legal, and they know it. But 
It's because what they do is they're, they've spent 75 years dehumanizing Palestinians. They spent 75 years throwing around Islamophobic tropes that we end up seeing that the world somehow questions like, hey, maybe it is okay to bomb a hospital. Take it out of the Palestinian context. And you saw the way that the United States reacted when there were claims that Russia was bombing hospitals in Ukraine. And you see, and you say, hey, no, whoa, whoa, yeah, no, a hospital, no way, no way, hospitals off limits. But because Israel has spent all of these years dehumanizing us, all of these years spreading Islamophobic tropes, all of these years somehow turning us into the boogeyman and lying, that people don't question the legality of it, the morality of it, to be bombing a hospital. That's the part that blows the mind. Now, you ask the question about propaganda and the and the Israeli propaganda, and I, and I want to respond to it a little bit. It is of a bad quality, but it doesn't need to be of a high quality because it's been proven that nobody's going to question them. Just the other day, the Israelis went into the children's hospital, and on the, in, on the wall, there was um, a calendar, handwritten calendar, with the days of the week with with uh, X's using a highlighter, X out the days that had passed. And the, the, the Israeli army spokesperson points to it and says, this is proof that there are hostages here and here's the name of their hostage, uh, the people who are holding them hostage. Well, what's written on the calendar? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Those are not the names of individuals. They're the names of the week. But again, those claims were parroted by mainstream media without anybody questioning. We also saw that they went in yesterday into the, the Shifa hospital and revealed all of this so-called weaponry that they found. Let me tell you, Frank, th there are more weapons in the average US household than were found in a Shifa hospital. One of the, the laptop that they showed was a Hebrew keyboard laptop with the image of an Israeli soldier on it. I'm pretty sure that the people of Hamas are not walking around with the image of an Israeli soldier and a Hebrew keyboard um, laptop. You know, it just defies logic. But again, it's all about them just throwing the allegations and hoping that they stick. And unfortunately, they do stick because we don't have a proper media that is actually questioning them. This is a media that is now embedded with the Israeli army. It's a media that agrees as a condition of being embedded that their footage will be screened by the Israeli army. And we know that when people are embedded that they tend to do things and publish things that are favorable to the army because they want that access. We saw this with, with the, the war in Iraq. Um, and so all of it is just absurd. And the, the real issue is, why is it that people aren't believing the same images that you and I are seeing day after day after day that are being broadcast by very brave Palestinian journalists who are risking their lives to show the world this genocide that is happening live? That's what, what boggles the mind. It blows me, it blows my mind and makes me so angry. Now, I, I say this, but but I, I actually have to back up and say the real world sees this and understands this. You, me, and all of the millions of people around the world who have gone out to protests, who've tweeted about this, who've gone on Instagram gone on TikTok and other forms of social media, who've written to their members of Congress, their parliamentarians, their, their leaders, that real world sees what you and I see. It's just the very small elite that somehow believe Israel's lies and believe the propaganda. I want to ask you something again, also because you're a lawyer. Um, do you believe that in accountability, at, at one point, um, 
because you know it's not like Israel again this time says you know we're not bombing hospitals uh, deliberately we're not targeting journalists de deliberate but it's not like they never you know they have done it before again and again and again I was talking to John Dugard um, well, two weeks ago who was behind the Operation Cast Lead report for the Arab League of Nations who said yes you know, during Operation Cast Lead Israel deliberately bombed 15 hospitals 30 mosques 38 schools and again in 2012 and in 2014. So that's something they've done before. But again, the mainstream media wants us to believe that history started on October 7th or whatever, right? But I wanted to ask you about accountability because I have worked closely in the in the in the last 10 years with lawyers, with you know, jurists. Um, and I know that after Operation Cast Led, there were a lot of cases put before um they've tried the Israeli Supreme Court, but then but hardly any of the claims for the Palestinians got anywhere. And I wanted to ask you, because like Karim Khan of the ICC was at Rafa, um, what is it, 10 days ago now, um, but he still hasn't done anything really, you know, concrete about what's happening. I know there was two um, communications slash complaints lodged at the ICC last week, one by a French lawyer, Gilles Devers, and one by other lawyers. I mean, we have to trust something. We have, you know, if we want to believe that one day the Palestinians will have justice, we, we have, even if it sounds like utopian, we have to believe in international justice. Where do you stand on this question? And please be optimistic. <laughs> I do believe in international justice. I don't believe that international justice is going to come at the hands of leaders or at the feet of an international court. And I say this as a lawyer, because it, it, to, to understand law is to understand how law is made. What makes law is power. That's what makes law. That's why if you look around the world, you'll see that that um, what are deemed white collar crimes, which are business crimes, which can potentially impact many, many, many more people. Um, the, the sentences that are meted out to people who commit these white collar crimes tend to be very low and yet um and yet crime like physical crime which tends to be limited in number in terms of who it affects the sentences are very very high why and that's because law is a reflection of power so i understand why why Kerim khan has not done anything because the courts our reflection of the power system. The world hasn't done anything. The international community as we know it, the international diplomatic community as we know it, has done nothing. It took 12 days for the Secretary General of the United Nations to call for a humanitarian ceasefire. Not a full ceasefire, humanitarian ceasefire. Um, and so I don't believe that international justice is going to come at the hands of the 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 international diplomatic community or um or at the at the feet of a of, of an international court because the courts themselves are just reflections of power but i do believe that international justice is going to happen because i believe in the power of people how what brought down south africa's apartheid system was not a legal knockout, although there were some legal wins, there were some legal victories. What brought down the system of apartheid was not an international community that somehow deemed magically that apartheid was wrong, no. What happened was it started with the grassroots movements, grassroots movements demanding boycotts, and that grassroots movement then became the power that we then saw around the world. So it was people power. It was that people were leading and the leaders were following. And that is precisely what I think is gonna happen in the case of Palestine. We've already seen that so much of the, the uh, so much energy around the world is now invested in the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. 
because people see that their elected officials are doing nothing. They see that the international courts are doing nothing. You know, this was an international court that rushed very quickly to uh, to go after Putin. It's an international court that spent a lot of time going after African leaders, but it's an international court that isn't defending the the, the most vulnerable the most vulnerable people in the world, which is Palestinians who are stateless, armyless refugee population, dispossessed, and you don't see that the courts have been rushing to defend them. So I do believe in international justice. I just don't think that it's going to come through the court system or through the politicians. It's going to come through through you and me, and I believe in the power of people. It's going to start with the, with the, with the boycott movement. The boycott movement is going to build and expand, and then it's going to reach a place where politicians finally see that it doesn't make sense to back Israel. I'll give you an example, Frank. Right now, if you look in in the United States um, and what's happening with the United States with Biden, you asked the question about Biden. President Biden is in, in lockstep. He's firmly walking alongside with Netanyahu. But if he steps back and looks at the public opinion polls, he's gonna see a very different reality. 80% 80% of Democrats believe that there should be a ceasefire. And yet only 8% of Democrats have signed on to a ceasefire resolution. It shows you the disconnect that the leaders have with the people. But the more that people keep pushing, the more that people keep pushing, after all, politicians are, are people who are seeking votes. Um, these are not, these are these are followers, they're not leaders. When more and more people start pushing, you're very quickly going to see those numbers rise. And that's what I mean by international justice. It's coming from people. It's not coming from institutions. Thanks, Diana. You know, I think I actually want to end it here because I want, I need, like personally, it's very selfish. I need some positive vibes. And I think that's, that's the only thing we can sort of believe in, right? That's what I keep telling friends and like, you know, that there's actually so much beauty in the world, you know, so much love. And you can see the 800,000 in London, in Brussels, where it was like about 60,000, 100,000 in Paris, despite the, the bans and stuff. So I completely agree with you. The people know. And um, and I've been surprised even in my sort of, um, you know, um, some of my friends that are not political or some old friends that are contacting me again now because they they know I it's a question I, I care very much about and they're asking for once the right questions, you know. Uh, and so we have to keep believing in the sort of in human civilization, right? Otherwise, it's very dark. But I think, um, yeah, thank you for this, Diana. I want to yeah. just say, wanna, you, you can edit this out if you want, but I want to tell you a little bit about um, about civil, like humanity. You know, in in no, I don't want to edit it out if it's about humanity, but I, 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 you you can if you want. I mean, it's up to you because you, you know you you're the editor. You choose. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Um, I you know I, I don't know if you know this, but I, I used to live in Gaza. I lived in Gaza for a year and a half. Strip is an absolutely incredible place. Not for any reason, except for the people who live in Gaza. And, you know, speaking of humanity, the people in Gaza um, see where the world stands. They see the protests. They see and hear the numbers of people who are coming out in the streets, not just in Amman, not just in Muscat, not just in the Arab world, I'm saying this, you know, not, not just in Cairo, but in, in Chile, in France, in, in Germany, in Canada, in, in the belly of the beast in, in Washington, DC, um, in Bolivia, in Colombia, they see all of it. And the amazing thing, Frank, is my friends who I'm in touch with every day, do you know what they do? This is how, this is just to show you the love that they have. 
do you know that every day they ask me how I am? Mm. It just, it shows you the, I, I don't, I, I don't like getting emotional on these things, but I do. It shows you that love is emanating from Gaza. And they feel the love that is coming back from people around the world who are trying to stop this. And this is where I have hope. Because even in the face of genocide, of ethnic cleansing, of unspeakable crimes that are being, that Israel's committing it against Palestinians, unspeakable crimes, that they still have the dignity, the decency, and the love to ask me how I am. And to ask me to to always continue to tell the world about what's happening to them. You know, it's it's just that, and, and you see messages that are coming from them thanking people. I mean, that's where, again, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. It's just that, you know, humanity is starting from there. Yeah. I'm sorry for getting emotional. Frank. It's just, it's, I, I'm, it, this has been so, it's just been so difficult to watch and, and to, and to live through. And you, you were asking earlier um, in the WhatsApp, um, again, you can edit this all out about repression here. You know what there, there's a lot of repression that's happening here, but the, 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 the repression is like a, a drop in the bucket compared to what, is happening in Gaza. But one of the things that is just the most um, like soul crushing is that we can't even speak out mm -hmm. about what's happening, what Israel's doing to our friends, our, our cousins, our relatives, the people we love who are living in Gaza. We, we can't even speak out about it. And that's why, like when I see these massive protests and I see the actions that are happening and I see the way that people are trying to disrupt everyday life, and I see what's happening on on social media, I, I I feel like lifted because I can't say anything, because Israel's made sure that it's we are that our voices are crushed, and that people are literally living underneath rubble, and we can't say anything. Um, anyway. I don't know what, what, how to end it. You you can end it how you want to end it, but it's the the fact that that at the end of the day, when when I I, and I swear to you, I I can just show you message after message after message of friends who, in the midst of this, ask us how we are. That's humanity. That's love. And that's what I wish the world was about. Yeah. Thanks, Jana. It's a, it's a beautiful way to end. And I think this is what keeps us going, you know, and it's, uh, you know, I've got also a, a couple of friends in, in Gaza that I haven't seen for like ever, but um, yeah, I, I, they do the same. And, um, and shukran uh, tir, Jana. I think it's, it's okay to be emotional because it's a very, you know, emotional moment and i think we um that's why it's important also for me to talk to people like you and actually like these like whatever conversations interview are also a way for me to talk to people that i love and think alike and kind of comfort me a bit you know so um you know, so thank is, you uh, 